nine beings that are not from this earth, according to the Bible. Numbers 9 and 8. The sons of God in the Nephilim. Biblical references to otherworldly beings. When we plunge into the pages of the Bible, we come across some pretty fascinating things that sounds like it's from a sci-fi movie. It's true. The Bible doesn't come right out and talk about aliens like we see in movies or read in science fiction. But it does mention some unusual beings and events that make you wonder. Could these be about creatures from other worlds? The Nephilim. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 mentions beings known as Nephilim that some consider supernatural or celestial. This verse has sparked endless debate about whether the Nephilim were earthly giants or something more divine or alien. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. Now it happened when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and desirable and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose and desired. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive and remain with man forever because he is indeed flesh, sinful, corrupt, given over to sensual appetites. Nevertheless, his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. They were Nephilim, men of stature, notorious men, on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God lived with the daughters of men, and they gave birth to their children. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, great reputation, fame. This brief mention has sparked endless debates and theories. Were the Nephilim angels fallen beings, or simply men of great stature and power? The sons of God are not earthly beings. This refers to the unnatural progeny of the partnership between the sons of God and the daughters of men. However, there were individuals of distinctive size on the earth both before and after the flood, and also afterward. These ones before the flood were notable because of the diabolical element of their parentage. They were the mighty men of old, men of renown. At first glance, there is no indication of angelic or demonic involvement. A passage in Job, on the other hand, provides a better understanding. God explains to Job his omnipotence by recounting his power over creation. Job chapter 38 verses 4 through 7. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you know and have understanding. Who determined the measurements of the earth if you know? Or who stretched the measuring line on it? On what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, angels, shouted for joy. The morning stars are best interpreted as angels. We also know that mankind had not yet been created when God laid the foundation of the earth, so the reference to sons of God is another reference to angels, implying that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are also angels. The three main perspectives on the identity of God's sons are as follows. Number one, they were fallen angels. Second, they were powerful human rulers. Or third, they were godly descendants of Seth intermarrying with wicked descendants of Cain. The fact that the phrase, sons of God, always referred to angels in the Old Testament lends support. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 2 contrasts the sons of God with man, implying that these are non-human beings. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 says that man began to multiply and daughters were born to them. The Hebrew word for man is the generic term for mankind, as used in Genesis chapter 5 verses 1 through 2. The sons of God are contrasted with man. Thus, the sons of God were distinct from man and married all mankind's daughters. As a result, the sons of God must be non-human beings of some kind. These beings were filled with lust when they saw the daughters of men and the angels cohabitated with the women. This produced offspring who were half angelic and half human, known as Nephilim. However, these beings would not have free reign on the earth. God was going to send a great flood. The Great Flood. Picture the world back then, full of life and busy with all sorts of things happening. But even with all this, there was a dark problem growing. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. 
the Lord saw that the wickedness, depravity of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination or intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. God tells Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 through 14. God said to Noah, I intend to make an end of all that lives, for through men the land is filled with violence. And behold, I am about to destroy them together with the land. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make it in it rooms, stalls, pens, coops, nests, cages, compartments, and coat it inside and out with pitch, bitumen. Can you imagine what Noah must have felt, being given such a monumental task to build an ark, a giant boat, in preparation for a catastrophic flood that would wipe out every living thing? God did not intend for the human race to remain in this rebellious state indefinitely. This means that our rejection of God has reached a point of no return. God will not woo us indefinitely. There will come a time when He says, No more. The Bible gives us hints at a world that has deviated far from what God intended. So, as Noah builds his ark, a massive vessel, about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high, you can feel that something really bad is about to happen. Continuing from the story, Noah gathers his family in pairs of all living creatures, as instructed by God. The ark turns into a sign of safety and hope during the flood. Then, the rains come. It's not just a heavy downpour. It's like the heavens themselves have opened up. Water covers the earth higher than the mountains. Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. All living beings that moved on the earth perished. Birds and cattle, domestic animals, wild animals, all things that swarm and crawl on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath and spirit of life, died. God destroyed, blotted out, wiped away every living thing that was on the surface of the earth. Man and animals and the crawling things and the birds of the heavens were destroyed from the land. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. After a period of forty days and forty nights, the rain finally stopped. Eventually, the waters receded, and the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. To put it in perspective, it's like parking a car on a tall hill after a heavy storm. But instead of a car, it's a massive boat. And instead of a hill, it's a group of mountains. You would think this would be the last time we read about the Nephilim or giants, but after this we see various instances. The Exploration of Canaan it appears that the fallen angels committed their sin again after the flood. However, it is likely that it occurred to a much lesser extent than before the flood. We go to Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. Here we meet a new set of characters, Moses, the Israelite spies, and the inhabitants of Canaan, including the descendants of Anak, who are linked to the Nephilim. Who exactly were these descendants of Anak? The Bible introduces them during the story of Moses sending twelve spies to explore the land of Canaan. The spies come back with a startling report. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anna come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. This verse suggested that the descendants of Anak were related to the Nephilim, known for their great size and strength. Moses, leading the Israelites out of Egypt, sends spies to scout the Promised Land. The spies come back terrified, saying, Hold on, didn't we just say the Nephilim were wiped out in the flood? In the Old Testament, giant is more commonly referred to by the word Rephaim. Throughout the entirety of the Old Testament's narrative, the Rephaim serve as a fascinating and significant recurring motif. Where does the Bible mention Rephaim? The Rephaim are first mentioned in Genesis 14. The Rephaim also with other large people, are also mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. It is also regarded as the land of the Rephaim, of giant stature, for Rephaim used to live there, but the Ammonites call them Zemzuman, a great numerous people, and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before the sons of Ammon, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. The name Rephaim, which literally means terrible ones, gives us an indication of the intimidating and fearsome nature of these individuals. 
This is not the only time we see these giants after the flood. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, there is an interesting story about King Og of Bashan, a giant man. Og is referred to as the last of the Rephaim in Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 11 and later in the books of Numbers and Joshua. Rephaim is a Hebrew word for giants. In the days of Moses, Og king of Bashan was a mighty and infamous Amorite king of Bashan who reigned at Ashtaroth, who fought the Israelites on their way to the Promised Land. As the Israelites journeyed towards the Promised Land, they encountered many formidable foes, and King Og was one of them. He fought fiercely against the Israelites and led his entire army against them. The king Israel had to deal with was King Og of Bashan, who sent his entire army against Israel. The Israelites then marched towards Bashan, where King Og confronted them at Edrei. Because of Og's reputation, the Israelites were terrified. Do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him into your hands, along with his entire army and his land, God assured Moses. The book of Deuteronomy includes a narrative of a conflict that occurred between forces led by Moses and those led by Og. According to the biblical account, Og was the ruler of 60 different walled cities, all of which were taken by the Israelites. Israel slayed the entire forces and conquers all 60 cities in the kingdom of Og, which had the same tall walls as Sion's. When God chose to hand over an enemy to his people, even strong fortified cities were no match for the enemy. In addition to this, he was a very large man and slept in a bed made of iron that was nine cubits long and four cubits wide. 13.5 feet long and 6 feet wide. The inclusion of this detail draws attention to Og's massive stature. A man in need of this size, bed, was most likely tall. Israel destroyed the entire population and took control of all 60 cities in Og's kingdom, which had the same high walls of Sion's. When God decided to hand over an enemy to his people, high-walled cities were no match. Later, at the city of Jericho, the most spectacular demonstration of that truth would occur. According to Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, Og was a descendant of the Raphates, indicating a man of great stature or giant. His colossal bed had become famous and, no doubt, had been saved as a memento. Joshua chapter 12, verse 4. In the territory of Og king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Raphaim, who lived at Ashtaroth and at Edri, Based on a few theories that Bible scholars and enthusiasts consider, some suggest that Nephilim might not have referred to a specific group of people, but rather was a term used to describe any large and mighty warriors. So, the descendants of Anak might not have been direct descendants of the pre-flood Nephilim, but were simply similar in stature and strength. Another idea is that something similar happened again after the flood. This time, the sons of God came down to earth and created a new group of Nephilim, this could be why there were giant people, like the descendants of Anak and Canaan. There is a less popular theory that suggests the gene for the Nephilim, which are giant beings, survived through one of Noah's family members. Although it's a bit of a stretch, some people believe that the wives of Noah's sons might have carried this gene. However, in this perspective, the story of Nephilim isn't about physical giants but represents moral and spiritual challenges. The giants symbolize the significant obstacles that the Israelites had to overcome in their faith journey. So, how do these pieces fit together? On one hand, we have Noah and his family, the sole human survivors of the flood. On the other, centuries later, there's a mention of the Nephilim, or their descendants in Canaan. Number 7 and 6, the Cherubim and the Ophanim. Ezekiel's Vision Similarly, Ezekiel's vivid vision of four-faced creatures riding a flying chariot. Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 5 through 28 reveals beings that are not of this world. In this account, he describes a whirlwind emerging from the north, a massive cloud with flashing lightning, and something resembling glowing metal at the center of the blaze. Upon closer inspection, he observes four living creatures that resemble humans, but each one possesses four faces and four wings. In the text, it is described that the legs of the beings are straight and their feet resemble a calf's hoof. They shine like burnished bronze. Each of the four beings has a human face, but on the right side of their head, they have the face of a lion, while on the left, they have the face of an ox, and an eagle's face is on the top. 
This description appears to be something out of this world. The cherubim are celestial beings created by God. They appear in the Bible after Adam and Eve's fall from grace as the first of the angelic hierarchy. Genesis 3 accounts for what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command by eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. After doing so, they could have also eaten from the tree of life, which would have given them eternal life. They were forced to leave their paradise, which resulted in Adam potentially going back and disobeying God again. However, the answer to this is given in the following verse. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So God drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he permanently stationed the cherubim and the sword with the flashing blade, which turned round and round in every direction to protect and guard the way, entrance, access to the tree of life. What a terrible situation it would have been if Adam had eaten of the tree of life and so have been perpetually established in his fallen state. God sent a contingent of glorious and trusted cherubim to guard access to the tree to prevent that. We don't know Adam's reaction to witnessing these glorious cherubim for the first time in human history. Perhaps awe, fright, and wonder are all emotions that come to mind. In other sections of the Bible, we are told that how people reacted to seeing angels. Zechariah, for example, in Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense, where Zechariah saw the angel. He was troubled and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your petition in prayer was heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. Adam realized that his transgression had cut him off from the company and presence of a holy God. Oddly enough, the next occurrence of the cherubim in the Bible involves recovering what was lost. In Exodus chapter 25, Moses was given specific and detailed instructions on how to make several articles of furniture that would be used in the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, where God promised to meet and commune with Moses, were the first to be detailed. What did God want to go over or on top of the mercy seat? He chose representations of the cherubim in gold. What an awesome sight that must have been. The cherubim associated with the very presence of God. For those two sources in the Bible, it appears as though the cherubim's major responsibility may be to declare man's sinfulness and protect the presence of God from sinful men. Cherubim are real and powerful beings. However, the cherubim in the Bible were often representative of heavenly things. Ezekiel chapter 10 verses 8 through 14. Beneath their wings, the cherubim seemed to have something in the form of a man's hand. Then I looked and behold, there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside one cherub and another wheel beside each other cherub. And the appearance of the wheels was like a sparkling Tarshish stone, burl. As for their appearance, all four looked alike, as if one wheel were within another wheel. When they moved, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. But they followed in the direction which they faced, without turning as they went. Their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and the wheels were full of eyes all around, even the wheels belonging to all four of them. Regarding the wheels attached to them, I heard them called the whirling rolling, revolving wheels, and each one had four faces. The first face was the face of the cherub, the second the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. The cherubim are shown in Ezekiel 10 as having not only wings and hands, but also being full of eyes, encompassed by wheels within wheels. However, Ezekiel also paints a gloomy tone in chapter 10, and the cherubim provide the hint. The cherubim are associated with God's splendor. The Ophanim. The Ophanim are deeply intertwined with the movements and will of God. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 19. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And when the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. We read of these angels in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel was written during a very tough and challenging time for the Israelites known as the Babylonian exile in 6th century BC. This was when they were taken away from their homeland against their will. During this hard time, 
when their religion and society were being turned upside down. Ezekiel shared his prophecies and visions, including those about the Ophanim. The depiction of the Ophanim aligns with the broader theme in Ezekiel of God's mobility. In a time when the temple in Jerusalem, seen as God's earthly dwelling, was destroyed, the vision of the Ophanim suggests that God's presence was not confined to any single place, but was instead dynamic and omnipresent. The term Ophanim originates from Hebrew, meaning wheels, which describes their unique representation in the scriptures. Ophanims are unique compared to other types of angels. They are shown as both amazing spiritual beings and mysterious symbols. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 13. The Ophanim are most notably mentioned specifically in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 15 through 21, where they are described as wheels within wheels, full of eyes all around. This alone sets them apart from the more familiar depictions of angels with human-like forms and wings. The eyes symbolize knowledge and awareness, suggesting that these angels are all-seeing or omniscient, a trait that aligns with the divine attribute of omnipresence. This scripture is part of a larger vision experienced by the prophet Ezekiel, filled with symbolic imagery and deep spiritual meaning. This part comes in where Ezekiel describes a vision involving four living creatures and a set of wheels associated with them. These wheels are what the Bible refers to as Ophanim. Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 15 through 16. Now, as I looked at the living beings, I saw one wheel on the ground beside the living beings, for each of the four of them. Regarding the appearance of the wheels and their construction, they gleamed like chrysolite, beryl, olivine, and the four were made alike. Their appearance and construction were a wheel set at a right angle within a wheel. The concept of a wheel within a wheel can be seen as a representation of the intricate and hard to grasp ways in which God operates. Additionally, the wheel's unique ability to move in any direction without pivoting, as mentioned in the verses, may symbolize God's omnipresence and omniscience. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction and the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood still, these stood still. And when those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 20 through 21. The movement of the wheels is not random, but is directed by the spirit, indicating divine guidance and purpose. The movement of the wheels is not independent. It's entirely in sync with the living creatures. This could symbolize the harmony between different aspects of God's will and its execution. The term spirit in the verse is critical. It's the driving force behind the movements of both the creatures and the wheels. In the biblical context, spirit often refers to the divine presence or the Holy Spirit. This suggests that the actions of these celestial beings are guided by divine intent. Over centuries, theologians and scholars have interpreted the role of Ophanim in various ways. Some people believe that the Ophanim, with their amazing look and the way they move, show how great and powerful God is in the universe. The Ophanim are seen as embodiments of the divine order, maintaining balance and harmony in the universe according to God's plan. The Ophanim are closely associated with the throne of God, which in represents divine authority and governance. Their presence and actions are seen as integral to maintaining the order and structure of heaven. In the Bible, God's throne is a symbol that represents His power and the way He rules. The throne of God is like the ultimate symbol of His rule over the universe. The Ophanim are often described as being near this throne or even part of its structure, showing that they are closely linked to God's power and decisions. Since the Ophanim are close to God's throne, they are seen as key players in making sure that God's rules and plans are carried out in heaven. This shows how they are always ready to uphold God's order and authority. Ophanim today. Ophanim have had a significant influence on art, literature, and popular culture. Their depiction in the book of Ezekiel has inspired various art forms, ranging from traditional religious paintings to modern digital images. This has played a crucial role in transforming the way Western societies perceive angels. Over the centuries, artists have been captivated by the unique description of the Ophanim. In ancient religious art, 
they were often depicted in accordance with Ezekiel's vision, emphasizing their otherworldly and mysterious nature. This portrayal challenged the conventional depiction of angels as human-like figures with wings. Instead, artists explored more abstract and symbolic representations, highlighting the divine mystery and omnipresence associated with the Ophanim. In contemporary times, the influence of the Ophidim can be observed in digital art and visual media. These celestial beings have been portrayed in numerous ways, ranging from abstract and symbolic styles to more realistic depictions of wheels and eyes. This shift in artistic representation demonstrates a sustained fascination with these entities and a broader attempt to creatively articulate spiritual concepts. The impact of the Ophidim goes beyond just art. In books and stories, these angels have encouraged authors to write about topics like godliness, mysterious spiritual truths, and otherworldly phenomena. In popular culture, the Ophanim have appeared in various forms, from characters in fantasy novels and films to motifs in video games and graphic novels. These representations mix classic ideas from the Bible with modern views, attracting many people and making them more interested in the mysterious parts of studying angels. Yes, there are beings that are not from this world in the Bible. What else is out there? The Bible's mysterious beings, whether spiritual, celestial, or something else entirely, remind us that there are more things in heaven and earth that are created by God more than we've ever dreamt of. And that's an exciting thought. Number five and four, Angel Michael and Angel Gabriel. Gabriel. Gabriel is undoubtedly one of the most popular angels mentioned in the Bible. The name Gabriel originates from the Hebrew language, which means God's hero, the mighty one, or God is great. Scripture refers to him as Jehovah's messenger or the Lord's messenger. The Bible never uses the term archangel to refer to a specific angel, despite referring to their work more frequently than other angels. Angels are not human beings, but rather supernatural beings who have earned wings through virtue in the afterlife. When characters in the Bible come into contact with angels, they often experience a sense of awe. Gabriel appears four times in the Bible as God's messenger, bringing important revelations that are crucial in unfolding God's plans and purposes. In Daniel chapter 8, verses 15 through 16, we see Gabriel deliver God's vision for the end time from heaven's situation room, revealing God's plan for history. Gabriel assured Daniel that history would culminate in Christ's return, the Prince of Princes. In the New Testament, the first time Gabriel is mentioned is in Luke 1. Zacharias was waiting in the temple before the Lord when Gabriel appeared on the right side of the altar, which was considered a place of favor. Initially, Zacharias was terrified as no one in his time had ever seen an angel before. Luke chapter 1 verses 12 through 13. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name him John. It is common for people in the Bible to feel awe when they see an angel. The angel answered first by introducing himself as Gabriel. Luke chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife has advanced in her years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled at their proper time. Here, angel Gabriel puts a verdict on Zacharias. Zacharias doubts the word of God. Therefore, Zacharias would lose his ability to speak until the child was born due to his doubt. Lips are sealed by unbelief and remain closed until faith returns and bursts forth in praise and witness. The crowd outside was impatiently waiting for the priest to burn incense. Usually, he would have appeared much sooner. Zacharias had to make signs when he finally emerged to communicate with them. Angel Gabriel. Then they discovered that he had seen a vision in the temple. No matter what epic missions Gabriel had previously undertaken for the Lord, this one indeed topped them all. He was sent to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, 
to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Mary was the name of the virgin. This is what Gabriel had to say to that young lady. Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 32. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. God entrusted this angel Gabriel with a great deal of responsibility and honor. Christ's life was touched by angels well before his birth, as his birth was to be a one-of-a-kind event, a new life that occurred outside of the human process, in a virgin without a father. Certainly, the lady to bear the Christ child had to be informed beforehand. She had to be prepared for an event that would have been impossible without God's help. Gabriel gave her the news. Mary was understandably perplexed. Gabriel explained, however, that it was the power of God himself who would cause it to happen. One of the main services of angels to human beings is to transmit knowledge from God to us. Angel Michael. As we know, Michael is an archangel, but what does that mean exactly? What has he accomplished? What are his duties? And how does he fit into God's heavenly host? Michael is the name of the archangel. That name begs the question, who is comparable to God? Many parents, both Jewish and non-Jewish, who name their sons Michael have no idea what the name means. We are introduced to Michael by the prophet Daniel. Daniel had been praying and fasting for three weeks, and an angel had appeared to him. However, the angel was thwarted by a figure known as the Prince of the Kingdom of Persia, who stood in his way for 21 days. The entire time Daniel had been fasting and praying. This was clearly a high-ranking demon sent to Persia to represent the devil's kingdom and oppose God's. The angel stays with Daniel long enough to outline future events for the Jews, but then must return to fighting the Prince of Persia, and the Prince of Greece will soon join the fight too. Only Michael stands by this angel in the face of these forces. Michael might deserve the title of general, since we always see him struggling with some spiritual issue. Michael is the only one the Bible calls an archangel. In the book of Jude, verse 9, we find the name of the archangel Michael. The word archangel comes from the Greek word archangelos, which means chief angel or chief messenger. Although the Bible doesn't use the term archangel to describe Michael, there is reference to him being one of the chief princes by another angel. Jude 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation. The phrase, one of the chief princes, implies that Michael has peers. However, if there are any other archangels, the Bible does not reveal their identities. Michael stands guard over Israel. An angel describes how the Jews' final days will unfold in Daniel's final vision. Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will appear at this time. Michael is a military commander of some angels. In the book of Revelation, John had a vision of a great war taking place in heaven. He witnesses a battle between Michael and his angels and the dragon, who is also known as Satan, and his angels. However, Satan and his army are not strong enough to remain in heaven and are cast down to earth. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. God will turn the tide against Satan at the midpoint of the great tribulation, first in heaven, then on earth. A battle will take place that will deny Satan access to heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Angels of faith and fallen angels fight in this dramatic scene. What is the date of this battle? This battle occurs at the midpoint of the seven-year period, as described by Daniel. In regard to material attacks against the believer, Satan and his demons were disarmed at the cross. During Jesus Christ's second coming, Michael the archangel will accompany him and shout out the exciting news to all those who await their resurrection. Michael will also speak the word of life to those who have passed away in Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. 
First, the believer who have died will rise from their graves. To protect Israel, the Archangel Michael and his fellow angels will fight against the dragon and his demons. The angels' method of warfare will be similar to what they do on behalf of all believers today. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. As Michael fought on Daniel's behalf against demons in the Old Testament era, angels fight for believers today and will fight for Israel in the tribulation to come. Despite the devil's fury, he and his demons will not triumph. Indeed, they have no place in heaven any longer. They will not, in the end, thwart God's plan for Israel or the return of His Son. Number 3. Fallen Angels Fallen angels are not originally from earth. These beings were not originally created evil. According to the Bible, some angels sinned by following Satan's guidance and rebelling against God's commands. This caused them to leave the place where they were supposed to be. This act of rebellion is considered as sin. The Bible states, Jude chapter 6, And angels, who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these he has kept in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Jude's letter is famous for addressing controversial issues, and one of them is the topic of fallen angels. In this letter, Jude discusses the imprisonment of these angels who will be judged for their wrongdoings on the Day of Reckoning. It is not too much to say that the New Testament nowhere else represents so many strange phenomenons or raises so many curious questions within so narrow a space. These are angels who did not keep their proper domain. There is some measure of controversy over the identity of these particular angels. There are two key places in the Bible that make reference to angels engaging in sinful behavior. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. We read, He is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. God judged these wicked angels and punished them by putting them in everlasting chains. Their pursuit of freedom through sin only led to bondage. Similarly, those who insist on having the freedom to do whatever they please are like these angels, and they too will be bound with everlasting chains. True freedom is attained through obedience. If angels cannot break the chains sin brought upon them, we are foolish to think that humans can break them. This gives us lessons. First, It assures us that certain men causing trouble will be judged, no matter their spiritual status. If God judged the angels who sinned, He will judge these certain men. Secondly, it warns us that we also must continue walking with Jesus. Every good and holy influence surrounded them. They saw God and abode in His courts, and they conversed with seraphim and cherubim. Their daily activities were all of a sacred order. Worship and service were their responsibility and joy. They were not only in paradise, but also in the very dwelling place of the Almighty God Himself. Yet, evil found its way into the very hearts of angels, including envy, ambition, pride, and rebellion. And as a result, they fell, fell to the earth, and never rose again. This should serve as a lesson for us not to make any assumptions about our position below. The beings we now call evil angels were part of God's original creation of spirit beings. Though they were initially created as sinless, holy beings, these angels chose to rebel against God. They left their actual habitation, the reason for which they were created. When they chose to do this and sin against God, it was at that point they became evil angels, and they were not created as evil beings. The evil angels, like the good ones, were all given the ability to choose or make moral decisions. You and I are far from perfect. We are not fallen angels. We are not angels at all, but we have evil hearts within us. Therefore, let us not presume for an instant that the most privileged position can screen us from the worst of sin. Angels are beings of incredible power. We know that they have exceptional intelligence and beauty. By rebelling against God and committing flagrant sins, they demonstrate their wickedness. After God's final judgment, the following words will be spoken. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, 
and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. These angels will remain forever evil. Lucifer and all the angels were constantly in God's presence and were aware of God's glory. As a result, they had no reason to rebel against God and turn away from Him. They were not enticed. Despite knowing what they were doing was evil, Lucifer and the other angels rebelled against God. No salvation for them. Scripture teaches that God has provided salvation for fallen humanity. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Yet, there is no salvation for these fallen angels, Paul wrote. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. At the very end, they will bow. Though they will never be saved, there will come a day when the evil angels will bow before the Lord. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus wins at the end. An angel occupies a high position near the throne of God. Are they not all ministering spirits? We have evidence in Scripture that they are called on grand occasions to discharge high commissions for the King of Kings. And yet these courtiers, these household messengers of the palace of heaven, these domestics of glory, even these went astray and fell and turned to devils. No one should ever think that just because they have a position of authority within the church fall to pride. The arrow sent by the Prince of Darkness can penetrate even those at envied positions. The most prominent positions in the field of service are not risk-free. The higher up you go, the more dangerous the position you hold because of your prominence. The forces of evil make their most determined assault on the most steadfast soldiers of the cross with the hope of toppling the standard bearers and sowing discord across the camp. The angels who sinned were originally given the power to choose. When God created the angels, they were sinless, holy beings. Though they were created good, they used their choice to rebel against God. In doing so, these perfect beings abandoned the purpose for which they were created. The fallen angels became the evil angels of the Bible, bringing spiritual and moral ruin to the world. They will bear the consequences of their sin for all eternity. Those angels who rebelled were not God's elect angels. Finally, there is no reason to believe that angels would repent if God gave them the opportunity. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The fallen angels seem utterly dedicated to standing against God and God's people. The Word of God says that the severity of God's judgment varies according to how much knowledge a person possesses. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. But the one who did not know it, and committed acts deserving of a beating will receive only a few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. The fallen angels, with their vast knowledge, thus richly deserve God's wrath. The Holy Spirit strives with us, but never with fallen angels. The devils are left alone. God could have left us alone because we have been given to idols, and yet he follows us with warnings of mercy. There is no forgiveness, hope, or heaven's gate for devils, but all of this exists for us. Please do not reject these precious gifts of almighty love. Let us turn to the Lord with all our hearts, knowing he turns to us with such special favor. Their failure made a significant gap in heaven. We go there to fill the space and repair the breach made when they were tossed down from glory. Think about it. When you read, he took not of angels, but the seed of Abraham, be taken aback and rushed to Jesus and, O oh, saints. Number two, Satan. In the book of Revelation, the figure of Satan stands out as a symbol of ultimate evil in opposition to God. This mysterious book, filled with symbolic imagery and apocalyptic visions, often portrays Satan as a deceiver, an accuser, and a force of chaos and destruction. 
One striking quote from Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, describes him as the great dragon, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. This description highlights how strongly Satan's influence can lead people away from what is true and right. Satan's role and depictions. Satan is shown in different ways starting from the book of Genesis. The story of Satan's deception of Adam and Eve is a pivotal moment in the Bible, setting the stage for humanity's ongoing struggle with temptation and sin. He often serves as a symbol of evil, temptation and opposition to God. Tempter and Deceiver. One of Satan's most prominent roles in the Bible is that of a tempter. In the book of Genesis, he appears as a serpent who tempts Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. This act of temptation leads to the fall of man, setting the stage for Satan's ongoing role as a deceiver and tempter of humanity. Satan, appearing as a serpent, cleverly manipulates Eve by questioning God's command about the forbidden fruit. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. This question planted doubts in Eve's mind. Satan then directly contradicts God, saying, You will not certainly die. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, and suggests that eating the fruit will make them like God, knowing good and evil. Eve, now convinced by the serpent's words, eats the fruit and gives some to Adam, who also eats. This act of disobedience against God's command leads to immediate consequences. They become aware of their nakedness and feel shame, a sharp contrast to their previous innocent state. The Accuser In the book of Job, Satan's job is to question and test faith, which is similar to how he is shown in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, Satan tries to trick people and lead them in the wrong direction. This is seen as a big challenge against what God wants and the honesty of those who believe in God. The trials of Job symbolize the spiritual battles believers face, emphasizing the theme of faith and integrity under trial. In the story of Job, Satan appears as an accuser and a challenger of faith and integrity. This story offers an incredible insight into the nature of suffering and the steadfastness of faith. The story begins with Satan presenting himself before God alongside other heavenly beings. God points out Job, a man of exceptional faith and integrity, living in the land of Uz. Satan challenges this, suggesting that Job is only faithful because God has blessed him abundantly. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan asks. Job chapter 1 verse 9, insinuating that Job's faith is conditional, dependent only on his prosperity and well-being. God then permits Satan to test Job's faith, but forbids him from harming Job himself. Satan then plans a series of crises that strip Job of his wealth and children. Despite these horrible losses, Job's response is one of remarkable faith and integrity. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job chapter 1, verse 21. Unsatisfied, Satan returns to God, claiming that physical suffering would surely break Job's integrity. With God's permission, Satan afflicts Job with painful sores all over his body. Even in this misery, Job maintains his faith, refusing to curse God as his wife suggests. His resolve is reflected in his words. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job chapter 2, verse 10. The story of Satan challenging Job's faith and integrity in the book of Job is a powerful narrative about human suffering, divine sovereignty, and the enduring nature of true faith. It shows beforehand how goodwill finally wins over evil, like in the book of Revelation. This gives hope and comfort, proving that when faith is tested, it can become more robust. It shows how, in the end, faith wins against Satan's lies and charges. Adversary to God's plans. Satan's role as a disruptor and an opponent to God's plan is consistent. In Matthew and Revelation's books, he emerges as a force attempting to undermine the divine order. In Matthew, he tries to tempt Jesus, and in Revelation, he gathers armies for a final stand against God. Both stories highlight Satan's ongoing battle against God's will, and in both, his efforts are ultimately frustrated. Symbol of evil and sin. In the book of Revelation, Satan is portrayed as the ultimate symbol of evil and sin, playing a crucial role in the narrative as the arch enemy of God and humanity. Satan first appears in Revelation as a deceptive force, manipulating events and leading humanity astray from God's path. 
He is the driving force behind the rise of the Antichrist and the false prophet, planning a grand scheme of evil that results in the gathering of nations for the final battle against God, known as Armageddon. Armageddon is a physical battle and a spiritual climax of the ongoing struggle. Revelation chapter 16 verse 14 mentions, They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Here, Satan uses his deceptive powers to unite the rulers of the earth for this epic battle. In this battle, Jesus Christ plays a central role. Revelation chapter 19, 11 describes him as a mighty warrior. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. Jesus, leading a heavenly army, confronts Satan's forces. Imagine a world where the tension between right and wrong reaches its peak. Satan, having gathered his army, stands ready to confront divine authority. This moment is charged with anticipation, as it's not just a fight for power, but a decisive moment in the spiritual history of humanity. However, the book of Revelation also highlights Satan's ultimate defeat. In a dramatic turn of events, God's power triumphs, and Satan is cast into the lake of fire. As Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 states, And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. This act symbolizes the end of Satan's reign of evil and the restoration of God's order. Linking this narrative to Ephesians provides a deeper insight into the spiritual nature of the struggle against evil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This verse underlines the idea that the battle with Satan is not just a physical or earthly conflict, but a spiritual one involving a fight against the pervasive powers of evil that operate beyond human sight. Satan's opposition to God and his people. The dramatic war in heaven as depicted in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, paints a heavenly battle beyond our earthly realm. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This passage illustrates Satan's ultimate defeat and expulsion from heaven. It signifies the loss of his place and power in the heavenly realms, a transforming moment that marks the beginning of his intensified wrath on the earth. Following his defeat, Satan's focus turns toward the earth, specifically targeting the believers or saints. The final battle. The battle of Armageddon concludes with the defeat of Satan. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20 states, but the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This signifies Satan's ultimate defeat, marking the end of his influence and the victory of good over evil. In simpler terms, the final battle of Satan, Armageddon, is where he gathers all the world's leaders to fight against God's forces. Satan's ultimate fate. Satan's ultimate fate, as described in the Bible, is a story of his final downfall and eternal defeat. Initially, Satan is restrained in a significant way. Revelation chapter 20 verses 2 through 3 tells us, He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. During this time, Satan is locked away, unable to influence or deceive the nations of the world. This period is often seen as a time of peace and righteousness on earth. However, this peace is not permanent. After a thousand years, Satan is released for a short time. Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 8 describes this moment. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. This release leads to Satan gathering people from all over the world for one last rebellion against God. But unlike his previous schemes, God's power quickly and decisively crushed this final rebellion. The final stage of Satan's fate is his eternal punishment. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 states, And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. 
This lake of fire represents an eternal separation from God and is the ultimate end for Satan. It signifies not just a physical punishment, but a spiritual and eternal defeat. Number one, you. What does it mean that Christians are not of this world? The particular phrase, not of this world, appears in John chapter 18, verse 36, where Jesus says that his kingdom is not of this world. John chapter 18, verse 36 says, Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world, nor does it have its origin in this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting hard to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. In this statement, Jesus was being questioned by Pontius Pilate during one of his trials. Pilate had called Jesus into the palace and was trying to find out the charges against him. He essentially asked Jesus to incriminate himself. As Roman governor in Judea, Pilate had the important duty of keeping the peace and maintaining order. The Jewish High Council, however, had a different agenda and sought to have Jesus put to death. They sent him to Pilate, knowing that he alone had the power to issue a death sentence. John chapter 19, verse 10. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you, and I have authority to crucify you? In order to convince Pilate that Jesus and I have authority to crucify you. In order to convince Pilate that Jesus was a threat to Roman stability, Caiaphas, the high priest, accused him of claiming to be a king. This charge would suggest that Jesus was recruiting rebel forces to launch a revolution against Roman authority. Luke chapter 23, verses 2 through 5. They began to accuse Jesus, asserting, We found this man misleading and perverting our nation and forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar and claiming that he himself is Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, It is just as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were insisted and said, He stirs up the people to rebel, teaching throughout Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as here in Jerusalem. Caiaphas was hoping that Pilate would decide to execute Jesus in order to prevent any possible uprising. When Pilate questioned Jesus about whether he was king, Pilate was most likely referring to a political role and suspecting that Jesus would be charged with inciting rebellion against Caesar. However, by stating that his kingdom was not of this world, Jesus refuted the idea that he was a king in the typical sense. And this point was further reinforced by the fact that none of his followers fought to free him. Jesus acknowledges his kingship, but clarifies that his kingdom is not of this world. He implies that he comes from somewhere else when he says that he has come into this world. John chapter 18, verse 37. So Pilate said to him, then you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. This is why I was born. And for this, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, who is a friend of the truth and belongs to the truth, hears and listens carefully to my voice. The domain of the Almighty is heavenly and encompasses the thoughts and emotions of his followers. Its source is not of this world, and it is not derived from earthly might, physical strength, material riches, or armed forces. As Christians, we are followers of Jesus Christ and members of his kingdom, which is not of this world. We know that our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. Brothers and sisters, together follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern we gave you. For there are many, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, who will live as enemies of the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation, whose fate is destruction, whose God is their belly, their worldly appetite, their sensuality, their vanity, and whose glory is in their shame, who focus their mind on earthly and temporal things. But we are different because our citizenship is in heaven, and from there we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In response to Pilate's inquiry, Jesus declared that his kingdom was not of this world, indicating that he did not require any worldly defense as his kingdom was not established in this realm. Although Jesus acknowledged that he was the ruler of an empire, it was not one that posed a political threat to Rome, and his servants did not need to fight to protect him. Despite having the power to do so, Jesus prohibited his disciples from intervening and preventing his arrest. 
John chapter 18, verses 10 through 11. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? After conversing with Jesus, Pilate concluded that he did not intend to incite a rebellion and therefore did not pose a threat to Rome. As a result, Pilate informed the Jewish leaders that he could not find any valid reason to charge Jesus. Once, Jesus told the Pharisees, John chapter 8, verses 20 through 23, Jesus said these things in the treasury as he taught in the temple courtyard, and no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Then he said again to them, I am going away, and you will look for me, and you will die, unforgiven and condemned in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were asking among themselves, Will he kill himself? Is that why he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. To his disciples, Jesus explained that the world and the prince of this world had no power over him. John chapter 14. I will not speak with you much longer, for the ruler of the world, Satan, is coming, and he has no claim on me, no power over me, nor anything that he can use against me. The world hates Christ and his followers, for they are not of the world. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 16. I have given to them your word, the message you gave me, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world and do not belong to the world, just as I am not of the world and do not belong to it. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them and protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The phrase, my kingdom is not of this world, pertains to the source and character of Christ's kingdom rather than its physical location. The influence and potency of Christ's kingdom are derived from a higher power outside of this world, specifically from our Heavenly Father, God. Christ's leadership is not human-made, but of divine origin. Christ's kingdom is like any on this earth. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, what one likes, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. While earthly kingdoms are grounded in this world, Christ's kingdom distinguishes itself by being spiritual in nature, originating from heaven. It infuses life into the world. John chapter 6, verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Although the Lord's kingdom is not of this world, it exercises authority over this world and has a significant impact on it. Jesus Christ and his disciples follow orders from above rather than from below. As believers, we are to focus our minds on heavenly things rather than earthly things. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value. According to the Apostle Peter, it is important to prioritize obedience to God over human authority when it comes to following the law. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And Peter and the Apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. We have no other choice. As followers of Jesus, we are citizens of Christ's kingdom. This earth is not our permanent dwelling place. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh, and the lust and longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, pretentious confidence in one's resources, or in the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world. The world is passing away, and with it its lusts, shameful pursuits and ungodly longings. But the one who does the will of God and carries out his purposes lives forever. As believers, our primary loyalty lies with our ultimate authority, King Jesus. And we belong to the heavenly citizenship. Like Jesus, we can also affirm that our kingdom is not of this world. We wage spiritual battle, but the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. The weapons of our warfare are not physical, weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. As individuals who believe in God, our primary focus is to give utmost importance to the kingdom of God and abide by his principles of righteousness. We find solace in the fact that our King has bestowed us with the blessing of eternal life and that those who adhere to God's will shall live forever, while the worldly temptations and pleasures will eventually perish. Although we are currently living on earth, our earthly existence is momentary when compared to the infinite span of eternity. James chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy, the one God who has the absolute power of life and death. But who are you to hypocritically or self-righteously pass judgment on your neighbor? Come now and pay attention to this. You who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and carry on our business and make a profit. Yet you do not know the least thing about what may happen in your life tomorrow. What is secure in your life? You are merely a vapor, like a puff of smoke or a wisp of steam from a cooking pot that is visible for a little while and then vanishes into thin air. This world in its present form is passing away. The sufferings and trials that we face in our lives are an inevitable part of life itself. However, as believers, we must remember that our true home is not in this world. Hence, we know that such sufferings are temporary and fleeting. This knowledge gives Christians hope even in the darkest times. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. In this you rejoice greatly, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, which is much more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested and purified by fire, may be found to result in your praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not even see him now, you believe and trust in him and you greatly rejoice and delight with inexpressible and glorious joy, receiving as the result, the outcome, the consummation of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This broken place is not our ultimate destination. We are receiving an unshakable kingdom. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14. For here we have no lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude and offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with reverence and awe. As followers of Jesus, Christians belong to a kingdom that is beyond this world. We have been chosen by God to inherit the blessings of heaven, and that is where our true home lies. Titus chapter 3, verse 7 so that we would be justified, made free of the guilt of sin by his compassionate, undeserved grace, and that we would be acknowledged as acceptable to him and made heirs of eternal life, actually experiencing it according to our hope is guarantee. Until our King returns, we wait and we hope, and we do what we can to bring others into the not of this world relationship with Jesus Christ. Titus chapter two, verse 13 awaiting and confidently expecting the fulfillment of our blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Understanding our alien identity. The Bible speaks in various places about believers being aliens or exiles in this world. For instance, 1 Peter chapter 2 refers to believers as aliens and strangers on earth. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 10 through 11. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from the sensual urges, those dishonorable desires that wage war against the soul. This concept aligns with the idea that our true citizenship, as mentioned in Philippians chapter 3, is in heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But we are different because our citizenship is in heaven, and from there we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This brings us to a fascinating question. How did we become spiritual aliens? According to the Word of God, 
This transformation happens because God chose us. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. This election signifies a shift from an earthly identity to a heavenly one. When we are born again, as the Bible says, we become new creations. Our old selves no longer feel at home in this world. So in a way, we become spiritual aliens, not belonging to this world, but to a heavenly kingdom. Drawing parallels between our interest in extraterrestrial beings and our spiritual identity as aliens can be enlightening. Just as we are fascinated by the possibility of life beyond Earth, we can also find wonder in our spiritual journey as aliens in this world. This perspective can bring a unique sense of purpose and belonging. It reminds us that there's more to life than what we see and experience on Earth. But what difference does this make in our daily lives? Spiritual aliens, we live under a new constitution, the New Testament. We follow a new king, Jesus Christ. Our desires and cravings change as we seek to align with our heavenly citizenship. This transformation is beautifully summed up in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. This verse poses a powerful statement about the transformative effect of faith in Jesus Christ. Being in Christ is a key phrase here signifies a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just about believing in Him or following His teachings. It's about being united with Him in a spiritual sense. This union with Christ is fundamental to our identity and faith as a believer of Christ. Did you notice that each time we think of aliens, our imagination is normally drawn to beings that are totally different from humans? This is the same thing that comes to mind when the scripture refers to believers in Christ as new creations, although not entirely focused on physical differences. This is more directly towards spiritual transformation influencing our thoughts and actions, which makes us different from the norm. Being a new creation is what we consider to be central to the Word of God and the transforming power of Christ in us. It implies a unique transformation that goes beyond mere external changes. This transformation is spiritual and internal, which in turn also reflects on the external. It's like a rebirth, where a person's previous way of life, values, and worldview are fundamentally altered. The old life, with its habits, patterns, and sins, is replaced by a new life that is characterized by spiritual vitality and a renewed sense of purpose and direction. Embracing our alien identity. Let's not forget our spiritual journey as aliens in this world. We are chosen and transformed, living under a new rule, serving a new king, and indulging in new desires. Isn't it remarkable to think that while we search the skies for alien life, we, in a spiritual sense, are aliens ourselves, journeying through this world toward a heavenly home? What does it mean to not conform to the pattern of this world? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart, like here, as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in His plan and purpose for you. As believers in Christ, we are called to live differently from the ways of the world around us. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul instructs us to avoid conforming to the world's pattern. He warns us not to allow ourselves to be molded or squeezed into its way of thinking and behaving. This same term is found in only one other place in the New Testament, which is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Live as obedient children of God. Do not be conformed to the evil desires which govern you in your ignorance. Before you knew the requirements and transforming power of the good news regarding salvation, what is the meaning of the Christian teaching to not conform to the world, according to Paul and Peter? Christians should not conform to the ways of the world. That is, we should not allow ourselves to be pressed into following the corrupt customs, ungodly principles, or evil plans of action promoted by worldly men. The blessed man, according to Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, 
resists being conformed to the pattern of the world. Blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, following their advice and example, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit down to rest in the seat of scoffers, ridiculers. Christians live in the world, but their way of life is not shaped by the worldly principles. They follow Jesus Christ and pattern their lives after Him rather than following the ways of the world that are said to be controlled by the devil, who is considered as the God of this world, according to the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For as a believer, you have been called for this purpose, since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may follow in His footsteps. According to the Bible, the term world does not refer to the physical world, rather to the age. As per Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, Christians are rescued from this current wicked age, which is controlled by Satan and characterized by idolatry, carnal desires, and disobedience. Despite living in this world, believers rely on the powers of the age to come. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 5, and have tasted and consciously experienced the good word of God and the powers of the age, world to come. The Christian's mind can be transformed to break free from the world's conformity. Believers are able to obey God naturally and immediately because of the Holy Spirit's gift, which works to transform their hearts and minds from within. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. He has qualified us, making us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant, of salvation through Christ, not of the letter of a written code, but of the Spirit. For the letter of the law kills by revealing sin and demanding obedience, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death engraved in letters on stones, the covenant of the law which led to death because of sin, came with such glory and splendor that the Israelites were not able to look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, a brilliance that was fading. Why are people so interested in aliens? What is this fascination all about? Have you ever looked up at the night sky and wondered if we're alone in the universe? This curiosity about extraterrestrial beings isn't just a modern phenomenon. It has been part of the human experience for a long time. Fascination with extraterrestrial beings. For hundreds of years, our ancestors looked up at the same stars we see today and made up stories about creatures from other places in the universe. But why are we so drawn to the idea of life beyond our planet? Let's dive into understanding human curiosity and the influence of popular culture and media on this fascinating topic. Understanding Human Curiosity Human curiosity is as old as humanity itself. It's the driving force behind our greatest discoveries and innovations. When it comes to extraterrestrials, this curiosity stems from a deep-seated desire to understand our place in the universe. Are we the only intelligent life forms, or is there someone else out there perhaps looking up at their sky and wondering about us. The Bible touches on the vastness of creation and our quest to understand it. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26. This sentence expresses the wonder and curiosity we experience when we gaze at the stars and think about the secrets of the universe. Our fascination with the unknown and unexplainable extends to our curiosity about life beyond Earth. The possibility of extraterrestrial beings raises questions about creation, existence, and the limits of human understanding. The influence of popular culture and media. Popular culture and media have significantly shaped our perception of extraterrestrials. From classic science fiction novels to blockbuster movies and TV shows, the portrayal of alien life has captured our imagination and fueled our curiosity. Shows like Star Trek and movies like E.T., The Extraterrestrial, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind have brought the concept of alien life into our living rooms, making it a part of our cultural narrative. This image of extraterrestrials often shows what we hope for and what we're afraid of. In some stories, these space beings are shown as smart and kind, giving us an idea of what we could hope to be like someday. In others, they are depicted as hostile invaders, reflecting our fears of the unknown in the other. These narratives tap into our deepest emotions, hope, fear, curiosity, and keep us engaged in the quest for understanding life beyond our planet. 
The media also plays a significant role in how we perceive unexplained phenomena. Reports of UFO sightings, for example, often go viral, sparking debates and discussions about alien life. Even though the real explanation for these sightings is usually less exciting, we still find them fascinating. This shows how much we love to explore and understand new things, especially those that are mysterious. Fast forward to the modern era, where the concept of extraterrestrial life has evolved with our advancements in science and technology. The invention of the telescope expanded our view of the universe, revealing countless stars and galaxies. Could all these celestial bodies really be void of life? In the 20th century, the UFO phenomenon took the world by storm. Reports of unidentified flying objects, often described as advanced spacecraft, sparked a global interest. This era brought a significant shift from mythical interpretations to potential scientific perceptions. But why are people today, armed with powerful search engines like Google, still so captivated by the idea of extraterrestrial beings? Perhaps it's because, despite our technological advancements, the universe remains largely unexplored and mysterious. Are we searching for confirmation of our ancient myths, or are we hoping to find new truths? Our fascination with extraterrestrial life is not just about finding alien beings. It's about understanding our place in the universe. It's a quest that pushes the boundaries of our imagination and science. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with minds full of wonder and hearts filled with curiosity as we ponder the vastness of your creation. In this digital age, our search for knowledge often leads us down many paths, including the intriguing journey toward understanding extraterrestrial beings. We seek our guidance and wisdom in this quest as we try to comprehend the larger universe that you have masterfully designed. Lord, you have instilled in us an innate desire to explore and discover, a trait that reflects your own creativity and intelligence. As we delve into the unknown realms of space, using the tools and technologies at our disposal, we often find ourselves turning to the internet, searching for answers about life beyond our planet. In our quest for extraterrestrial life, help us to remember that it is not just about seeking what is out there, but also understanding more about ourselves and our place in your grand design. Father, guide us in our explorations. May our searches and inquiries be driven by a pure desire for truth and a deeper appreciation of the mysteries of your creation. Protect our minds from speculation and theories that do not align with your truth. Help us to discern fact from fiction as we navigate through the vast array of information available to us. As we Google and research extraterrestrial beings, remind us of the value of humility. The universe is a vast and complex masterpiece, far beyond our full understanding. Help us to approach this topic with a sense of acknowledgement of your work and reverence, knowing that there is so much more to your creation than what we can see or comprehend. Lord, in our pursuit of knowledge about life beyond Earth, let us not lose sight of the life you have given us here. Teach us to cherish and be stewards of the beautiful planet we inhabit, along with all its creatures. May our exploration of the universe bring us closer to you as we witness the boundless power and wisdom evident in the universe. We pray for those who are at the forefront of this exploration, the scientists, astronomers, and researchers. Grant them wisdom, insight, and ethical discernment in their work. May their studies lead to beneficial discoveries that enhance our understanding of the universe and our responsibility within it. Heavenly Father, as we look up at the stars and ponder what lies beyond, fill our hearts with gratitude and wonder for the vastness of your creation and our search for extraterrestrial life. Let us not seek merely for the sake of curiosity, but with a desire to draw nearer to you and to gain a greater appreciation of your majesty and sovereignty over all creation. In our human limitations, there is much we do not understand. We ask for patience and humility as we explore these mysteries. Let our search for knowledge about extraterrestrial beings be a journey that strengthens our faith, expands our understanding, and deepens our love for you and your creation. Finally, Lord, in our quest for understanding and knowledge, may we always come back to the greatest truth of all, that you are the creator of everything, seen and unseen, and in you, all things hold together. May this truth anchor us as we explore the mysteries of the universe. 
In Jesus' name, amen. However, the Bible talks about the end of this earth as we know it. To watch the truth about Revelation, click here.